to fess up. How many of you did not walk, but waddled after Thanksgiving this year? I see a few hands confessing. I see others confessing in their hearts. However you choose to lay your burdens down, know that it's okay. It is a day of celebration. It is a day of, some may say, excess. I say it is a day of abundance. A day where perhaps we do eat too many mashed potatoes. Lumpy or smooth, depends on your preference. Perhaps we do eat one too many turkey legs. Perhaps we prefer the light meat and the dark meat. Perhaps we have a side or a slice or two or three of pumpkin pie. And maybe, just maybe, we even have pie the next morning for dessert, for breakfast. And if you haven't figured out that secret, I pass that along to you. It's a good way to get rid of the sweets and the leftovers. But even though it is a season of abundance, um, and some may even say excess, it reminds us of all that we have to be thankful for. You know, the, uh, I was reading a book recently um, by, I think, Nathaniel Philbrick. I'm bad on names. I know that sounds strange to you, but I'm bad on that particular name. And the book was called Mayflower. And so it is about the voyage of the pilgrims, the 13 years or so before uh, they landed there on the shores of Cape Cod, and then that first Thanksgiving that they had in 1621, and all the time after. And it is largely as it is reported. There are many things that are not borne out by history. We see that as we examine facts and as we look back over time and as we look back over the evidence, it doesn't always line up with the way in which we were told growing up. But that first Thanksgiving largely bears out. There was a celebration. There was a celebration as many were brought together pilgrims and the Native American tribes, Indians that were there, um, as they came together and feasted and truly counted their many blessings uh, and their abundance. And it is important for us to remember that. It's important for us to hold on to those moments because the pilgrims didn't know what they had when they were about to depart from England. They didn't know what they had um, because they had heard reports of violence and bloodshed on the shores of America, and there would be much of that in the years to follow. But in this particular slice of history, and in that particular moment, there was abundance, and there was thanksgiving. Now, some historians have debated whether or not that was the first Thanksgiving. There are other states that lay claim to it, Virginia, as well as Florida with St. Augustine, and then even in Texas. Um, but regardless of where you put it, it is a feast of abundance. And as we kind of gather here together in this space today, we are reminded over and over again of our abundance. We are reminded right before Advent. And I know it seems like Christmas is here, but this is actually the last Sunday of the church calendar year. It is referred to as Christ the King or Reign of Christ Sunday. And so I want to read to you one of those scriptures that is marking this occasion and share with you the abundance that I think is found therein. And it's in uh, Ephesians chapter 1. It starts with verse 15, and we continue on to verse 23. You're welcome to follow along in the Bible, Pew Bible, you've brought with you, smartphone, however, just to listen uh, to God's holy word as found in Paul's letter to the Ephesians, 
in chapter 1, starting with verse 15. I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints. And for this reason, I do not cease to give thanks for you as I remember you in my prayers. I pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation as you come to know him, so that with the eyes of your heart enlightened, you may know what is the hope to which he has called you. What are the riches of his glorious inheritance among the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power for us who believe, according to the working of his great power. God put this power to work in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age to come. And he has put all things under his feet and has made him the head over all things for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Sweet Holy Spirit, may you be present in this place and all who are gathered here this morning as we gather with grateful hearts hearts that indeed are abundant and overflowing. We pray that your presence would be felt. I ask, Lord, that my words would not be my own, but that they would be yours, that my mind would not be my own, but that it would be yours. And most of all, sweet Holy Spirit, that my heart would not be my own, but that it would be wholly thine, broken and open and honest before these people of God. Amen. One of the remarkable things that um, pastors don't often get to do is to go back to former congregations and to witness to where they are at 5, 10, 15, 20 years down the road. Methodist pastors, or United Methodist pastors in particular, because we are appointed to a position and a place for a period of time and then we move on to the next thing. And oftentimes, when we move on to the next thing, we are so consumed with that work and that church and that appointment that it is hard for us to go back. I had that fortune and that blessing to do a little bit of that this past week when I was on vacation. I traveled back up into the hills of southwestern Virginia, and I went to visit my old congregation, it was not a Sunday morning. There was no one in the pews, but it looked much the same as it always had. And as I sat down with um, some of uh, the people from my church, sadly, there were others who had passed away. But those that were there shared in that same joy. Those that were there shared in that same Christian fellowship and spirit, and those that were there were as happy to see me as I was to see them. There was much love and much giving thanks, an abundance of it. So, you ever go and you visit a friend, and it's been a long time, and it's almost as if you're like Moses coming off the mountaintop? You go and you visit them, and then as you come down off that mountaintop, you're glowing, and people go, wow, where have you been? And they know, they know. And there are people and times and places where we visit where we are truly able to give thanks. Paul is reflecting on his time with the Ephesians, and he is reminding them to give thanks there in that opening verse. He's reminding them of all that they have brought to him and of all the joy and the hope and the abundance of life that they will continue to find if they remain steadfast in their hope and love of Jesus Christ. He says in verse 15, 
I have heard of your faith. Imagine that, right? Not just that people know that we're there, but that they have heard of the witness and the work of the kingdom that we have done. That there is so much of it that it overflows. The word abundance in the Latin, the root means overflowing. And so is there that much faith that we are pouring out in the lives of the saints and sinners, of those family members and friends around us, that our faith goes before us as a witness to all who would know us, that it meets people on the road ahead of us, so that even before we get there, our presence is made known but ultimately not our presence, but the witness of Jesus Christ. I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints, and for this reason I do not cease to give thanks for you as I remember you in my prayers. I pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you, and look at what he's praying for, this abundance, a spirit of wisdom, and revelation as you come to know him. See, it's one thing to pray that someone would gain knowledge. It's a whole other thing to pray that one would gain wisdom. Because there is a deep-seatedness to wisdom different from knowledge, just the information of facts and the conglomeration of them. If they are put together in a whole that helps us, that steadies us, that sets right our ship, that gives us peace in the midst of the storm. There's a story of the way in which God provided to the pilgrims in that first journey over in 1620. It was... Uh, late uh, October, I believe, it was one of the indentured servants of one of the main people on the ship, one of the main uh, families on the ship. And uh, he had been uh, down uh, in the, I'm really bad about describing a ship because I don't live on a ship or work with ships, but down in the, the hull of the ship uh, for about 30 or 40 days at that point. Their whole journey was a 65-day ordeal. But about 40 days in, um, he decided he was going to get up and get some fresh air. And he didn't realize being down below because the boat was rocking back and forth. It was steadier down below than it was up above as the tempest was tossing across the seas. And as he stepped out up above onto the deck of the ship, he slipped and he went over the side of the ship this indentured servant, and they thought all was lost. He went plummeting 10 feet, uh, according to the accounts, down, onto, down into the sea where he grabbed hold of some of the rigging, some of the, the rope, and he was dragged along, and they pulled him up out of the depths and back onto the boat where I'm sure he was beyond shaken. He went back down in the hull of the ship, and three years later, he was married, and about 10 years after that, he had 10 children, and about 80 years after that, he had 88 grandchildren. God is a God of abundance in ways that we could never possibly anticipate or imagine, and his blessings are beyond our ability to comprehend, but we are grateful that he gives us wisdom, that he gives us revelation, that he gives us a peace in the midst of the storm to be able to steady us and to right our ship and to put us back on dry land. And so it was for the pilgrims, and so it is for us today. We see the many ways in which God unfolds and is at work in our lives. And if you do that exercise where you go around the table at Thanksgiving and you say something you're thankful for, and then are some of you those people that don't want to have to say what you're thankful for because you do it every year? It's a hard thing sometimes. 
if we are not about the constant work of saying what we are thankful for to come up with new things to be thankful for. But if we make it a practice to live out of abundance rather than scarcity, to have that mindset of what Christ has and is doing within us and within this congregation, then people will see it, then people will pour it on it, then people will write letters about it, then people will witness to it. The one thing that I hear as much as anything else uh, from this congregation, from those in the community and around, is I felt so welcome when I showed up in the doors of this church. I felt like I was part of it from the moment that I first set foot. I felt like I was a part of the congregation from the very first time that I came. That is a spirit of abundance that you all operate within. And that is the spirit of this season as we give thanks. God put this power to work in Christ, in verse 20, when he raised him from the dead. So it's not that we linger on the death, but that we recognize that the death leads not to the end, but to resurrection. And seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, that God, as judge, is king over and reigns over all of creation. We sang about that this morning in the anthem. Let all things now living unite in praise and thanksgiving. If we were silent, the very rocks would cry out. I don't know about you, but I don't want my rocks talking to me. So it sounds to me like I got a lot of shouting that I got to get busy doing. Far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age to come. And he has put all things under his feet and has made him the head over all things for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Is Christ your all in all? Is Christ overstuffed to the point that you were waddling in your faith? Do people recognize that when you come in the door? Is there that glow or is there that recognition that they're always sending me a card or they're always calling me on the phone to check on me or they're always shooting me a text message or they're always greeting me in church or they're always doing this overflow of abundance? I think sometimes because we operate all out of a notion of scarcity, we are worried that we will be and do too much. But I don't ever think that anyone in this community would feel poorly if we were known as the congregation that did over and above and beyond at all times, in all circumstances, in all manner of things for Jesus. I feel like we always have that opportunity, and I was talking with someone before service about how much we choose to eat at Thanksgiving. And this was one of the very few years that I didn't eat too much. But if we always have that choice, and we know that that choice is borne out with our decision, then we have the option, the possibility of choosing to bear witness to more than who we are and what we know, and that we live and we lead with our faith in Jesus, first and foremost. Back up on the hills and hollers of Appalachia where I went, there in the homes of practically everyone is an old painting which may even be in some of your own homes. And it is of, uh, of a man, of a man that is kneeling with his hands folded in prayer at the table. 
at that most common of places, he feels an abundance and he gives thanks. This day, in this season, before Christmas hits, even if you've got your wreath up and your lights on the tree and it's all decorated, what are you giving thanks for? And where is your abundance? Is it in Jesus? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. May God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit bless, preserve, and keep you now and forevermore.